Rita Lucarelli studied at the University of Naples, where she received her MA degree in classical languages and Egyptology. Her 2005 PhD is from Leiden University in the Netherlands, and her dissertation was published in 2006 as the Book of the Dead of Gat Sashen. That's a tough one to say, Gat Sashen. Ancient Egyptian funerary religion in the 10th century BC. From 2005 to 2010, Dr. Lucarelli held a part-time position as lecturer in Egyptology at the University of Verona. From 2009 to 12, she worked as a research scholar on the Book of the Dead project at the University of Bonn. And she was a visiting research scholar at the Italian Academy of Advanced Studies at Columbia University in 2009 and at the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World, or ISAW, at NYU in 2012. Until June 2014, she worked as a research scholar and a lecturer at the Department of Egyptology at Bonn, and she's held a part-time position as lecturer in the same field at the University of Bari in Italy. Clearly, she gets around. As for the present day, Rita Lucarelli is currently Associate Professor of Egyptology at the University of California, Berkeley, and Faculty Curator of Egyptology at the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology there. And may we take this moment to congratulate her on her very recent achievement of getting tenure at the University of California, Berkeley. collective sigh of relief. What a wonderful feeling that is. <laughs> she's also a fellow of the Digital Humanities at Berkeley, and she's currently working at a project to produce 3D models of ancient Egyptian coffins at the Hearst Museum. The magical spells decorating these objects are taken as a case study for investigating the materiality of the text in relation to ancient Egyptian funerary literature. Dr. Lucarelli is completing a monograph on demonology in ancient Egypt, and she's one of the coordinators of the Ancient Egyptian Demonology Project, which has the very cool website address of www.demonthings.com. <laughs> she's also working on a web project called The Book of the Dead in 3D on the visualization of ancient Egyptian coffins through photogrammetry. But tonight, it's all about the demons. Please welcome Dr. Rita Lucarelli. Good evening, and so do I talk, and I don't need to use this, maybe. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Peter, and thank you to the HMNC for this kind invitation. I'm very happy to speak here tonight, and uh, well, coming from California, I'm also I'm South Italian. I've been living now for five years in California. So it's, it's good to be reminded what winter is. I mean, this is... <laughs> Sunny day for you, but for me still very cold. But anyway, I'm very happy to be here and to talk about my favorite topic ever, uh, magic and demonology, especially, as Peter said, I'm completing a monograph on uh, demons in ancient Egypt, uh, uh, a topic that is keeping me busy since uh, years now, but it's still very exciting, and uh, I keep making new discoveries, little discoveries that I'm happy to share tonight with you. So to start anyway, before speaking about the demons, um, I would like to talk about magic in ancient Egypt and define indeed what is magic for the, and what was magic for the ancient Egyptians. And I will show you different kinds of sources, uh, objects, text and uh, talk on the objects about their functions and how they, they relate to magical techniques. And to start with, one of my favorite objects ever uh, is this statuette. Um, it's a wooden figurine, actually, uh, dated to the late Middle Kingdom. Um, you can probably, okay, uh, they give me a very fancy, yes, pointer. So details, you can note the lion-headed face um, and that is, she's holding, is a female uh, naked body. She's holding uh, two um, snake wands. Uh, they look like this one, 
that is kept in uh, Cambridge. And those are clearly uh, tools used in magic. Uh, this one in particular has been found uh, entangled with hair. So going back to the statuette, we do not know exactly how it was used, but there are signs of use on it. So it was used in some performance. And in this case, this is one of the rare cases where we, we also have an archeological context of magic. Generally, magical tools and uh, texts are a bit found uh, out of context. This one was found in what we call the magician tomb. Uh, so a tomb near the Rameseum in Thebes, uh, where there were also other objects related to magical practices and even uh, papyri with magical text. So we know it was anyway figuring using magic, representing maybe a goddess, um, a female version of uh, a dwarf god with lion head called Bess that I will show you later, or maybe it was a sort of priestess with a lion mask. So in, um, in order to be assimilated to the, to the gods, we'll see other examples, priests could wear a mask. We don't know exactly, but it was an object found uh, um, in a context that speaks all about magic. And um, the snake is, um, Snake ones uh, or uh, uh, snake figures are uh, very much used in ancient Egyptian magic. So I thought that in order to define Egyptian magic, we should also speak about the reception of ancient Egyptian magic in the West. Um, and the snake still plays a role uh, already in antiquity. So already starting from uh, the Bible, probably you are familiar with the story that is uh, uh, told in Exodus. Uh, we have um, is a biblical story where uh, we have Egyptian magicians that who are presented as a sort of uh, indeed wizards um, uh, trying to um, in, um, do illusions, work with illusions, while the, uh, the, the real um, performers of miracles, so the real magic, we could say, is the one performed by Aaron, Aaron's staff transforming in a snake and swallowing the staffs of the Egyptian magicians. And in, it is said, it, if you can read on the screen, that the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. So Egyptian magic was already seen with, uh, as a secret art, as something secret, connected mostly to illusion, uh, not real, basically, uh, and also not, uh, not truth. Um, that's why, in the end, uh, we can say that God's snake won basically, on the Egyptian snakes. Uh, this conception of uh, magic as something uh, uh, related to illusion, to uh, a trickster gods or uh, um, a professionist is not the real one that we had in ancient Egypt. Uh, in ancient Egypt, uh, magic was a god, or better. We call magic uh, uh, a god um, who in ancient Egyptian uh, is called the Heka, and is represented in this image from uh, uh, Ramesi tomb, tomb of Ramses I, as uh, uh, indeed an um, anthropomorphic male figure. He, has, uh, he plays an important role, is uh, standing in the solar boat with uh, the sun god, and the scene, scenes rep representing the sun god in the boat um, in, during a, a journey in the netherworld are very common in ancient Egypt, are very important. They symbolized uh, the way the cyclical um, becoming of night and day, um, of uh, rebirth and death and rebirth uh, continue to happen, so day by day. So, so uh, basically, the whole uh, creation is represented in the scene of the sun in the boat, and Heka being part of the boat of the solar uh, um, god means that Heka plays a role in creation. 
So we um, translate Heka as magic, but there is a problem of translation of an uh, indigenous Egyptian term uh, translated in a word that in English has a different uh, perception. Um, magic, the English magic comes from Greek, mageia, but the Greek word uh, used uh, from the fifth century BC uh, as a negative, had a negative meaning. So mageia was a practice against the gods. This is not the case for Egyptian magic. Med Egyptian magic is integral part of religion and Heka is personified as a god. So magic is a god. Another um, one of my favorite images of the god Heka is this one from uh, a papyrus of the Book of the Dead, so a magical scroll to protect the deceased in the tomb and uh, accompanying him or her in the journey in the netherworld. And so here we, we see Osiris on a throne, <coughs> accompanied also by um, the goddess of truth and uh, of uh, order, Mat. And after Mat, you recognize again this male a human figure holding snake uh, stuff. So again, the, the, um, the snake wand is a symbol of magic and is a scene of um, uh, arriving, the disease arriving in the, in the netherworld, entering the, the so-called the hall of truth. So magic is uh, definitely seen as something positive. And there is also another interesting goddess. It's a sort of minor goddess not always mentioned in uh, textbooks on ancient, the ancient Egyptian pantheon. But uh, were it Hekau, uh, literally to be translated as great of magic, was an important goddess uh, um, also represented with the sun disk, so connected to the solar god again. Um, in this scene, uh, crowning the pharaoh, uh, also in other contexts, protecting the deceased. And this um, name, this divine name, Tueret Hekau, great of magic, can be found also assimilated in, uh, in connection to other goddesses like Isis, Mut, so very well-known goddesses. So to be great of magic is actually something divine, is a, a very positive uh, uh, characteristic. So in my study, okay, I'd never used this cream. I, <laughs> so I cannot really, this is not an advertising slide, uh, but I just, speaking about Egyptian magic, and since I'm try, I, what I'm trying to do in my research also distinguish different kind of magical practices and different kind of magics, uh, I thought it was nice photo to have. So if, if you want to try it anyway, I know my students told me that can be found at Target. If <laughs> <they don't. laughs> uh, <laughs> so what kind of magic they used in ancient Egypt, why they needed magic, and why we speak of magic as something anyway distinguished from the greater phenomenon of religion, although it is strongly connected to religion. Um, the Egyptians were basically obsessed with uh, protection, being protected from everything and everybody in life and in death. And in order to be protected, they were uh, using a lot of uh, magical practices, magical texts, and they were also asking the, the favor of the gods, of course, who should help to protect. So what we call defensive or apotropaic magic is a magic um, used especially for protection uh, to, in order to ward off the danger before the danger arrives. And when we will talk about demons as well, you will see how important it was to be able to ward off danger, especially uh, not only in the netherworld, but especially in certain regions of the netherworld where uh, uh, dangers were uh, very common. So um, spells of def defensive magic can be found uh, on different kind of objects. We have uh, amulets, uh, objects of protection, uh, which are also part of uh, this phenomenon that we can call defensive magic. Uh, but sometimes, well, they weren't able to use those spell of defensive magic on time. 
And so if something went wrong, if they would got bitten by a dangerous snake or uh, already have symptoms uh, of uh, illness, they will need what we could call curative magic. So the difference is that, well, let's say if you're on time and you see the snake coming, you can still recite a spell of defensive magic, but if the snake already been biting you, then you can still use curative magic and uh, hopefully you'll be fine later on. So we have also healing statues uh, used in temples for uh, disease, to cure disease, and uh, text which we call magical medical text, meaning that uh, magic was uh, um, mixed with uh, real medical practices and medical knowledge, and I'll uh, return on that later on. Another uh, interesting kind of magic used in pharaonic Egypt, but also later on in Greco-Roman Egypt and a lot in antiquities, transformative magic, uh, which you can also find in books uh, named as love magic. Probably you're more familiar with love magic. Love magic is uh, make sure to uh, bind your, uh, um, the, the person, change, you can change the, um, the feelings of, uh, of a person so that uh, he or she will love you in forms of uh, spells of love magic, or uh, you can try to transform their, um, you can try to bind the, the, the person to you. But transformative magic can also be uh, very positive, not aggressive as love magic and can be found also in uh, funerary, uh, mortuary papyri, where the deceased say that he wished to transform in a god or a, in a divine animal, even in a plant, um, in a sort of uh, very uh, powerful beings. Also, we should be aware anyway that there was no black magic in Egypt. So the concept of black magic is really more of a Western concept uh, um, and probably you now already understand why Heka being a god, uh, part of creation, um, there was no way that magic was illegal. We have a, a few examples of uh, spells used uh, against uh, magical spells used against the state, the pharaoh. In that case, that became an illegal form of magic because in ancient Egypt, you could use magic for uh, your own good, but you, you could maybe also use it, we have some cases, to harm a personal adversary, but you cannot use it against the pharaoh because that would be like going against gods. So we do not have um, uh, black magic uh, uh, and magic was uh, a totally divine matter. Uh, who were the main agents of magic? Well, the Egyptian magicians uh, um, were uh, priests, they could be doctors, um, they could uh, be also local wise men. We have different kind of magicians. But they had to deal a lot with the supernatural world. They, they had to be able to summon up the, the gods. And not only the gods, but also some other uh, liminal creatures that um, I call demon, uh, demons. And so today I would like to explain to you why I call demons and why I differentiate them from the gods. But before doing that, uh, we should also um, first speak about uh, the divine dimension and what gods were in ancient Egypt. Uh, they were called Necheru. So nature is the singular for uh, natural, plural, the gods. And gods were uh, um, very often uh, represented uh, also in papyri, um, or in temples, um, on the same, let's say the same kind of sources that we find that, um, that we use for demons were also used for the representation of gods. Uh, how can we differentiate what is a god and what is a demon? Where uh, gods appear a lot in myths of creations, where demons don't. So this is a typical scene uh, of uh, the creation according to the so-called Heliopolitan myths, so based on the myth of uh, 
the sun god as creator, Atum, the form of the sun god, and um, it's a beautiful image with um, the sky goddess note arching over the art god Geb, and Shu, the god of air, sustaining the sky with uh, a lot of other deities all around. Uh, is a scene that is often represented also on sarcophagi, is a protective scene, for, uh, especially for the deceased who wants to be reborn as a god as well. Um, so gods are part of uh, uh, a mythic dimension and demons are not. Gods also really take care of uh, the deceased uh, and also people in the, um, uh, on earth. Uh, um, so in, in this beautiful scene, we see again a priest with uh, a mask of the god Horus, the falcon god, who is uh, performing the uh, ritual of the mouth on the uh, mummified um, uh, deceased. And this ritual for opening the mouth was a powerful ritual for um, empowering the body of the dead and uh, having, having it ready for uh, the journey in the, in, the, in the afterlife. So gods really take care of the disease while demons we will see communicate with the uh, disease and also with uh, men, uh, humankind on earth, but they do not really take care of them. They just need to be appeased or uh, um, make sure that they will not be angry uh, at you. Another important dimension which is especially connected to the world of the, especially the main gods, the official pantheon, is the cultic dimension. So gods have cults on earth, they have shrines, they are worshipped. While demons, well, there are exceptions of demons that seems had some kind of worship, but in general they only appear in a in, um, in a different setting where there's no sign of real worship. It's only about communicating with the demons. Here we see again uh, Ra, here Ra Oracte in this uh, stila with uh, the deceased and his wife uh, honoring it. Uh, a problem uh, that we have with uh, gods and demons, and there are many of them, is a problem of identification. So manifestation, how the gods and demons manifest and how we recognize them. And the, the, the most unlucky one in being recognized is uh, Web Wawet, who is a jackal god. Um, he's an independent jackal god. Uh, with, uh, his, his name means the opener of the ways and indeed is found as a um, uh, guardian of gates. Um, but uh, he is very much confused with, uh, as in this uh, comics, with the most famous uh, Anubis, also jackal god um, taking care of mummification. So these, um, generally gods have a more fixed iconography in comparison to demons. Demons can uh, switch shapes uh, more often, but uh, we have, for instance, many jackal demons and many jackal gods, some uh, anonymous figures I'll show you soon that cannot be identified. So how you do in these cases, um, that's where context and text, if we are lucky to have text, help a lot. So here is uh, again a difference with Anubis and Web Wawet. Generally, Web Wawet is mostly represented as a full jackal animal, while Anubis has the head of a jackal and um, human body, but not always. Sometimes they are represented together and they are both two jackals. So it's, um, it's um, an open issue how to recognize uh, divine or supernatural figures. And we have also a lot of uh, jackal demons, as I say. So uh, I already say too many times demons. Demons, what are demons in ancient Egypt? We have seen magic, Heka was a god. Um, again, uh, we have first of all talk about the terminology we are using, which is sort of conventional translation of uh, ancient concepts expressed in a different way. So Heka, we translate it with magic. And what do we translate with demons? Uh, there's no 
one Egyptian word in ancient Egypt that we can really translate as demon. Uh, the English word comes from Greek daimon, and the term daimon, uh, I'll talk to you about it in a, in a bit, is uh, also very ambiguous, can mean a lot of things. Uh, but the perception we have of demons is generally the perception um, created by the Judeo-Christian um, sphere of religion where demons are basically bad. They are negative figures, they are punishers. So this is one of my favorite images of uh, uh, Dante's Divina Commedia, the Divine Comedy, uh, representing the nine circles of hell, and that's the ninth circle where betrayers are punished by uh, these demons. And so, um, Demons are seen indeed as punishers, as totally negative beings. We will see how in, that's not the case in ancient Egypt. Also, demons are seen from the same kind of the same kind of perception as uh, um, symbols of temptation, sin. So, in uh, this uh, very early painting of uh, Michelangelo, the Torment of Saint Anthony. Um, we see represented an episode uh, um, written in uh, the life of St. Anthony wh when he had a dream. Uh, he was levitating in the sky while being uh, uh, in the desert and attacked by demons. But of course, he was a very strong saint and uh, he uh, defeated all those demons. And here, demons are sins and temptations. Uh, and this is also not the case for the ancient Egyptian demons. Also, we think to demons as possessing humans. They possess the body. So we have a, a lot of uh, horror movies reminding us about this, um, like The Exorcist, 1973. Uh, there are um, no real cases of possession in ancient Egypt, although we will see how um, especially in relation to disease and illnesses, uh, they were kind of personifying the disease as a demon. So some scholars speak of possession in that case, uh, since the, the disease is possessing the body, but it's not exactly the same as in the real uh, uh, Christian ideology. And demons are much feared today. Uh, in my homeland in Italy, there is uh, an exorcism, a prayer of liberation course. Uh, you can in, uh, just enroll for 400 euros. It will take place in May, the next one. And it's offered also to teachers. Maybe they think students can be kind of possessed of demonic. <laughs> but anyway, so demons are still really uh, there, really actual. Uh, as a very dangerous creatures. And so one has to be related, uh, has to call God the, the only good God in order to be um, free from the demons. Um, but let's go back to antiquity. So let's see the definition of uh, daimon, which is where the word demon comes from. Um, there are many definitions of daimon and daimones in ancient, uh, from ancient Greek authors and philosophers, but uh, the most famous one is certainly the one from the symposium from Plato. Uh, so in Plato's symposium, uh, learned men, philosophers are discussing about uh, love. And well, love is also considered uh, by some of them as a demon. So that's why they explain what demons are, daimones. And so it says in this passage uh, that you can read on the screen, everything that is daimonic is intermediate between God and mortal. Daimonists are interpreters and ferrymen, carrying divine things to mortals and mortal things to gods, requests and sacrifices from below, and commandments and answers from above. From above. For the divine does not mix with the mortal, and it is only through the mediation of the daimones that mortals can, can have uh, interaction and interaction with the gods, either while awake or while asleep. So this idea of uh, demons as intermediates actually fits very well uh, the Egyptian conception of demons seen as uh, 
some scholars speak of minor gods, but anyway, liminal figures that um, uh, kind of uh, communicate between the main gods and the humans. Um, there is also another term that I like a lot to define uh, Egyptian demons, in general pre-Christian demons, which is uh, it's actually a German word, Grenzgänger, um, meaning uh, literally the border crossers. And uh, it's a word used by an historian of religion from Heidelberg, Gregor Hahn, who uh, was indeed um, uh, talking and he was studying and writing about uh, uh, pre-Christian concepts of uh, the supernatural. Um, he actually told me once that there's no way to translate it in English, that I should just use the word Grenzgänger because, well, the German is very pregnant, but, well, I think border crossers uh, uh, renders the idea. Um, the Greeks also distinguished good and bad demons. So in particular, the Agathos daimon was seen as a snake, um, as a benevolent snake, uh, here represented in this fresco in Pompeii uh, near an altar. So demons in ancient Greece already weren't, uh, by definition, bad. They could be good or bad. And here we are getting much closer to the ancient Egyptian uh, concept of uh, uh, demons. And so here they are, some of those uh, uh, creatures that uh, I call demons because in, in uh, so like you can see all those, no, this is uh, the disease, the goddess of the tree. So some of them, as I said, gods and demons appear together, but those, uh, um, beings, hybrid being with the animal head, not all of them, uh, and um, mummified sitting body, holding knives, uh, those are not gods with temples. Sometimes uh, they are anonymous. Uh, and they are represented a lot, especially in mortuary papyri, on coffins, in tombs, because they guard regions of the netherworld. Uh, they are not necessarily bad. They can only be dangerous to the one who doesn't have the specific knowledge to approach them. And this specific secret knowledge is contained in these spells written on papyri, in tombs and uh, coffins. Uh, and those spells give us the names of these demons, uh, all uh, tell us which uh, region of gate they are guarding. So they are anyway protectors, they are guardians, uh, and they have many names, different names, not just one. So there is not one name, again, that we can translate as demons. Uh, sometimes they have no names, they're only represented, uh, like here, um, in a series of always holding uh, knives, or again, uh, uh, demon uh, um, snake wand, uh, I particularly like this one with the duck on his head. I'm still looking for inspiration. It's a hieroglyph for fear, but I didn't find parallels still. Also, some of them, as you can see here, they, they all the lizards, which is a symbol of fertility, of abundance. Uh, and uh, you can see some of them have, are, are jackal-headed. Uh, we have two here, but are those Anubis, uh, are those Wepwawet, or is this just a jackal demon? Those are uh, questions one cannot answer uh, without the caption saying the name, but the function is clear. They are protecting here the mummified body of the deceased in the center. And here the mummified body is the symbol of the mummified Osiris, the god of the dead who will be uh, then uh, uh, reborn. <clears throat> so um, those kind of protectors cannot be considered main gods. They cannot be considered though as bad demons. And you can see some of the names, and here is another image of uh, those uh, uh, guardians uh, here represented in this papyrus in front of doors, so sometimes as a triad or individually. Um, here the deceased and the, the wife who are uh, entering uh, those uh, 
these regions uh, and have to pass through different gates. So names like face downwards, uh, numerous of shapes or set of voice, one who stretch out his brow, uh, one with vigilant face or the radiant one are uh, very evocative names. They say something about their function, they make allusions, they can describe a physical characteristic of the demons. And sometimes some of these names are also used for gods as epithets, god epithets. Uh, so there is anyway a lot of um, interconnections between uh, those gods and demons. And uh, this is uh, instead the coffin. And maybe you can uh, see here how the deceased is entering again a region at the end, here is the text he has to res recite, and then the, the demon is represented in, uh, into, in, in one gate. Another example of beautiful coffin with a series of demons is this one. Um, I have some close-up to show you the, the creatures, why on the, on the side of the cases, just generally that's the place of the demons on coffins, well, they were really protecting very close by the mummified body. So it's uh, an allusion, of course, to the myth of, of death and rebirth of Osiris and how uh, those uh, divine and demonic guardians were protecting Osiris' body. And uh, in, uh, at the Museum of Fine Arts here, there is also one uh, of the cutest uh, guardians, I know, with the four cobras uh, is an identified fragment and I hope to work on this later on, but at least I could uh, see from the text that this fragment uh, um, comes from a longer text which is part of a spell on how to approach this guardian. So there's the, the spell from the eighth portal of uh, spell 145 of the Book of the Dead. And this uh, guy with also, as you can see again, is holding a knife, uh, is called uh, he who protects his body. So his body, uh, meaning the body of the deceased. So again, uh, those are protectors, are not evil demons. And we have a few three-dimensional versions of those guardians. This is the one uh, I use for the flyer of this lecture. Uh, a very impressive little statuettes. Uh, they've been found only in royal tombs. Uh, kind of mysterious still why only in a certain context, royal context, Ramesid uh, um, New Kingdom and Ramesid period. Uh, and so we'll see here uh, the, the, the head of a gazelle seems like, uh, and the body in this counter position, almost uh, a bit menacing, aggressing. Uh, we have also another um, statue of the same group with the uh, demon, which is uh, uh, definitely a turtle demon. So it has the, the head of a turtle, and it's uh, really beautiful how, also how they connect the, the animal shape with the uh, uh, the wig, we saw with the human part. And so those also, the only possible explanation is that they were protecting, guarding the tomb of the, the pharaohs. But where, where, there are, where are the scary demons? Do we have scary demons in ancient Egypt or is only about guardians and protectors? And we have seen they're kind of cute. They're not really scary. I cannot say the, the guardian demons are scary. Uh, what we intend anyway is scary demons. Again, it's a, a question of interpretation of perception. Beauty is the eye in the eye of the beholder, of course. So maybe for what is uh, beautiful or ugly for us wasn't for the ancient Egyptians. So for instance, our idea of monster is something ugly, aesthetically ugly. And generally monster is a composite animal, a kind of fantastic animal like this one that is actually an Egyptian uh, creature uh, here in the real version uh, with Anubis. Uh, it's called Amemet, the devourer of the dead, and is indeed a composite animal, face of a crocodile, the body of a lion, and a, a, a hippopotamus. And the, uh, she, sorry, is a, is a lady. She appears uh, only in the scene of the final judgment of the deceased, uh, here we see the god Anubis who is uh, taking care of the, um, um, of, uh, the, um, um, 
the balance in order to um, weigh the, the earth with the goddess Mat. So this is the Egyptian art and the goddess Mat. What Amemet is doing is really, Amemet is, re is ready to devour the deceased who doesn't pass the judgment. Here even is, uh, even more, she's ready. She's ready to go as soon as, uh, if uh, the deceased has been lying, committing sin, and so he will recite the negative confession but will not pass the judgment. And here the deceased is Annie. This is one of the most famous papyri of the Book of the Dead with his, with his wife. The God taught, the Ibis God taught, is writing the verdict. And then after that, Amemet could devour the, um, uh, the deceased. But in fact, that never happened because all the Egyptians who could afford to have a Book of the Dead papyrus uh, in their funerary equipment, they would have the magic knowledge also to make sure to, to become a blessed dead, a transfigured spirit in the, in the afterlife. So basically they will never be devoured by Amemet, uh, who keeps staying hungry. And uh, this is also, well, I don't know if to consider, sometimes in books you, you find uh, Amemet described as a monster. In the eyes of the Egyptians, this wasn't a monster. The Egyptians were using uh, composite figures with different uh, par animal parts. Uh, uh, different hieroglyphs uh, on a daily basis. So this was just uh, uh, the, having different animal parts w was just a way to um, really make sure that the, um, the god, um, the, the demon here showed his power. Um, this can also be maybe considered a sort of scary creatures uh, with the crocodile uh, or vul vulture um, head, uh, spitting snakes, uh, holding other snakes, even with daggers on the feet. Uh, what was their function though? Well, they were actually scaring uh, another kind of demons, the nightmare demons. Uh, nightmares were seen as demons, uh, but the bad one, the real bad one, and they are never represented. Basically, the Egyptians never represent the evil demons. They only represented the protectors. So here, those are protectors, and they are uh, uh, depicted um, at the basis of this uh, headrest, which was used indeed for sleeping, although I know it doesn't look very comfortable, but we have a lot from ancient Egypt. The, as I say, nightmare demons weren't represented, but they were feared, and we have spells against them, like this one, a book of dispelling terrors which come to fall upon a man during the night. And uh, indeed, the, the um, nightmare demons was seen as coming from the sky, falling on uh, really the breast of the, um, of the sleeper, like in uh, this uh, painting. Um, and this is a bit, uh, the sensation we have uh, when we wake up from a nightmare is actually feeling kind of uh, heavy uh, in our chest. And so maybe this description, this kind of descriptions were uh, also made on the basis of what they felt. Um, and other evil demons that are not so often represented are maybe, because I cannot be sure of this interpretation, uh, are, can be represented in this sketch we see a kind of human figure sketched here, attacked by very stylized crocodiles. And this is a very short papyrus used um, as an amulet on the neck, rolled and kept on the neck, with the spell here, which is, which speaks about protection against the uh, uh, evil dead. I have the text here. They uh, talk about male enemy, female enemy, male dead, female dead. And so the evil dead uh, is a sort of companion of uh, the demons we have been seeing. Uh, but they are never represented again. So spells uh, uh, against um, those uh, evil um, menacing creatures are very common. But we do not have uh, representations of those demons. Uh, speaking about these amuletic papyri, uh, we have the so-called oracular amuletic decrees, which are strips of papyri um, uh, kept in uh, those 
well, we don't have many examples, but this is one of the most beautiful papyrus holder and brought at the neck as pro protection. And so they were, as I say, uh, seeking protection um, from uh, every male spirit, dead demon, every female spirit. Uh, and this text then they mentioned the demon, I mean the weret is the Egyptian term we translated as demon of the water, of the city, of the village, of the street. Everywhere could be one of those bad demons, but they, for a sort of taboo, are never represented. And these are the demons that I call wanderers, uh, because differently from the guardians, they uh, go around. They just, they are not static as the guardians, just limited to their own, to protecting their own gate. And uh, they wander around and they can bring deceased. They, they can be called in spells as uh, messengered, uh, messengers, murderers, uh, um, or other similar names, names uh, that make us think that they were going around in gangs, but they were controlled uh, by main gods, in this case by uh, the lioness goddess uh, Sekhmet. Uh, so this is also an indication that demons can be controlled and subordinated to gods, and therefore they are different. And uh, very nice, uh, the only example I found of a deceased demon represented is this uh, headache, uh, headache demon, I call, we call it, because uh, Sehakek, uh, literally means in ancient Egypt half head. And if you suffer of uh, migraine, you know that takes half head and it's very demonic. So apparently that's what uh, this uh, young male represents, Sehakek in the text uh, on this ostracon. Uh, we also have uh, the name of the parents, uh, which seems to be like foreign your name, not uh, Egyptians, is covering his face. Uh, and uh, he has here not his tail, but his tongue on his back. We know that because of the text. We say, you with the tongue on your back. So those bad demons could also really have uh, a distorted body, a body which is not uh, the, the proper body um, that should be. And this demonization of illness is um, actually also um, common in, in uh, other, um, um, not just religions, but just uh, feeling for uh, um, getting rid of the, of the illness in general. Uh, you have representation like here of the tooth worm as an hell demon. And this is uh, just um, an ivory carving uh, with uh, this hellish uh, scene, um, probably um, in also talking with colleagues uh, that work on other tradi demonic traditions where also we have the deceased demons. It seems that uh, demonizing an illness uh, helped the patient psych psychologically also to uh, be strong and get, get rid of the illness. And this is why we have many magical spells where uh, um, uh, medical um, prescriptions are also included. It seems like the Egyptian doctor were using uh, um, magical uh, spells together with uh, medical knowledge. And probably they saw that the combination of the two uh, was uh, really effective. Um, so now that we have just seen a bit of different kind of demons uh, uh, in ancient Egypt, uh, what about uh, uh, a comparison of the Egyptian demons uh, with um, neighboring countries, uh, so especially with Mesopotamia, which is a close uh, neighbor of ancient Egypt? Um, it seems that in Mesopotamia we have instead many more evil demons and that um, the, um, the conception of uh, um, being, uh, um, being protected by the, demon, uh, by the demons was uh, uh, also much stronger. So in this amulet against Lamashtu, Lamashtu is a, a famous uh, female 
demon, a demoness who was uh, especially feared by uh, killing because of killing babies. Uh, we see here um, the iconography of uh, where is here this Lamashtu is trampling a donkey. Uh, which remind an Egyptian iconography where anyway we see the god, Horus the child, trampling crocodiles, and the crocodiles here are the danger, the dangerous animal connected to the, also to the evil demons. And uh, on top of these two amuletic objects, this is called Chipus of Horus indeed because of uh, the figure of Horus the child, we see also two similar frontal faces. This is a god, again, it's Bess, it's an anthropo anthropo um, apotropaic god with a sort of lion face, uh, protecting women during childbirth childbirth from the bad demons, while um, um, this is Pazuzu, also a very dangerous demon. In this context, uh, Pazuzu, a demon, is protecting the owner of the amulets from Lamashtu, while here we have two goddess figure, gods figure in an object uh, uh, which is again which is again a magical object to heal to heal from uh, um, patients with disease but uh, the the iconography is much more connected to the idea that gods are uh, uh, in charge let's say on the demons so when you compare the different demonologies in polytheistic systems so pre-Christian demonology, you can see kind of uh, uh, nuances and differences how they deal, dealt with demons. Uh, the the m most important thing for me is that anyway, they all had beliefs in demons, in not main gods. And so uh, I also think that if Mesopotamia had demons as well as other uh, ancient civilizations, why Egypt should not? Why we should not speak about demons in ancient Egypt? So I, that's why in my book, I talk still about ancient Egyptian demonology. I call demons agents of uh, protection, agents of punishment according to the context, but I still speak about demons. While there are other scholars who prefer to speak only of uh, gods in ancient Egypt, minor and major gods, because we do not have a word for uh, demon. Also, what we do not have in ancient Egypt is a real demonology which is good for me because then, well, I can write a lot, I can do the demonology that they did in too. So demonology intended as a discourse on, demon, on demons, something that we found, uh, for instance, instead in the Jewish uh, uh, world where uh, uh, we have many texts describing demons, uh, uh, categories of demons, hierarchies of demons. Um, these are also magical objects, uh, so-called Jewish uh, Babylonian incantation ball, um, a bit older than the uh, objects we have seen from ancient Egypt. Um, they were inscribed also with uh, magical spells uh, all around, mostly having a sacred text, and then having uh, uh, the image of a demon in the middle, and those are well-known demons uh, with long traditions that uh, went through the Renaissance, the old, um, through the Jewish world, and is Asmodeus, it's called this uh, very dangerous uh, demons, uh, although here you can see it looks more like a sort of Batman or kind of funny one. Those sketches were not made by a really skilled artist. Um, the, the purpose was not to have very nice representation of the demons as for the ancient Egyptian sources, but they had much more information on these beings. Uh, oh, by the way, those balls were uh, used in uh, houses uh, uh, in order, uh, it seems, to trap the demon, to make sure that he will not move around freely in the house. Uh, they're uh, very interesting objects that are being uh, currently studied. So we do not have a demonology, but we do have in ancient Egypt a lot of demons. We've seen many uh, sources, and um, I'm currently working in um, 
finding uh, demons on coffins because, well, papyri have been uh, very much studied until now, while we have uh, many beautiful coffins around that, uh, in museums uh, um, that are still unstudied. And uh, coffins also have mentions of guardian demons or spells, speaking like this one, spell 72 of the Book of the Dead, where uh, it is at a certain point, rescue me from the voracious crocodile, sort of dangerous being, because I know you, I know your name. So it's a very um, often used spells on those coffins, like this one. And as uh, Peter said when he was presenting me, I am uh, working on a project for uh, um, realizing uh, 3D models of those coffins to make uh, possible to study the three-dimensionality of the object uh, and um, to study also the materiality of the text, how the text uh, completely, um, is completely connected to uh, the object. Um, why? Um, text on coffins. Well, uh, in the f especially from the first millennium BC, coffins were used uh, almost as if they were papyri. So we have here, for instance, from this picture, it, it seems like this is uh, a detail of uh, papyrus with spells. But actually, this comes from uh, a very heavily textualized coffin. Um, uh, from the 26th Egyptian dynasty. Uh, we have a lot of spells on those coffins. So we, we can speak of coffin textualization, of coffin magic. Uh, they really, especially in the later periods in ancient Egypt, they wanted the protection to be really close to the body, closer than having it on papyri. So we can really learn a lot from those texts, which are variants of the same text used on papyri. Uh, differently. So my project called the Book of the Dead in 3D uh, through photogrammetry is realizing 3D models of coffins and uh, sarcophagi. Uh, this is one of them um, with the spell also uh, connected to demons and protection for preventing the slaughtering done in uh, Hennenesut, kind of a bit mysterious title, but it's connected to also mythological fact and allusions. And as you can see, the, the, the text is just here. It's a very um, abridged version of the same spell we found in papyri. Other coffins we've been working at are uh, those uh, of UFA we found that we found in Berkeley at the Hearst Museum of Anthropology, where we have a vast Egyptian collection still unpublished. Um, and looking through the storage rooms, we could find uh, the inner coffin uh, uh, of this guy UFA, and so we could digitally reunite them. And again, here, we don't have much time, but I'll show you maybe the model. We have many images of mainly gods, but that help a lot to understand how the, um, this imagery of gods and demons uh, was used on sources. Uh, this is the coffin of Pachenef, uh, which wasn't in great conditions, but we realized the model because it has uh, my favorite guardians on it, so a series of... Uh, you can see uh, really simply sketched guardians, but they make sure to have uh, the names and part of the text that we find, we find on the most beautiful papyri. Uh, we also went a bit out of Berkeley, looking into minor collections, Egyptian collections in California. So the Museum of Man in San Diego also has some interesting coffins with uh, these kind of protective figures, gods and demons. Um, the, in San Francisco, there is a very interesting uh, co Egyptian collection as well, the so-called Sutra collections we are working on. As you can see here, these uh, very nice figures. Also, at a certain point, there is a sort of name, and so it's also a snake guardian figure. And um, let's see now if this works. I'll show you. Oh, okay, yes, it does. So it's just the website where you can find the, the models of the coffin we've been working until now, and you can download your own 3D model to have uh, at home for, uh, so you can navigate from uh, the different um, uh, link. So for instance, 
you go to the coffin, then the 3D model is here. Those 3D models uh, are also online on a site, on a website that will be published soon, uh, where we are working also with uh, annotations. And so here, for instance, uh, for, um, oh, so I think uh, this one. <clears throat> What I want to do is make sure that people don't just look at the models, but also understand what is written on it. So you have to learn the spells and know about all these demons. And so um, a nice uh, thing we can do today with this model is indeed uh, adding annotations and, for instance, clicking uh, on the text, the text part, and see where exactly the text is have a translation, transliteration for students of Egyptologists. Uh, or, um, so it's here, Just this is just an example of knowing more about the, the owner, find his name, where is his name, so you can navigate the model at the same time looking at the test, zoom in, sorry, I don't have a mouse here, it's a bit difficult. Zoom in and zoom out and see the, the details. And even you can add the vocabulary. So for instance, where is the word to eat? Uh, where is the word, where is the pronoun? <laughs> That's uh, very specific, maybe not too interesting, but um, I think those um, uh, annotations work very well for uh, and help our study also in general of the Egyptian religions. And you can combine models, of course, uh, when you find uh, ensembles and so uh, kind of, well, have fun with it by reconnecting them. <laughs> All right, so I think it's time to conclude this lecture with the last slides. Uh, so to conclude, uh, I want to quote a text, which is not a magical text, is actually a literary text from a very interesting tale uh, of uh, stories of gods, gods fighting between each other, Osiris getting mad to the other gods because they were not solving this important case uh, to decide who is going to be um, uh, the, the next, um, uh, the, 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 well, it, it's a longer story, but there was a divine tribunal having to decide between uh, uh, Horus and Set, and so indeed this is called the contendings of Horus and Set. So Osiris get mad with the other gods and say to the gods, now you pay attention to this matter. The land in which I am is full of savage looking messengers who fear no god or goddess. If I send them out, they will bring me the hurt of every evil doer and they will be here with me. So here, it seems to me, is speaking of not other gods, of real dem demons. Those are called messengers also in other spells. And uh, their existence is therefore proved also in non-magical text. And even those beliefs in demons, in the protection you need in the house, in the netherworld, um, according to certain manifestation and of gods and demons, it's also present in Egypt nowadays. Uh, this is a photo taken uh, in modern times uh, in a village in the south of Egypt where uh, there is a dead gazelle and a lizard hung from the window of, of a house. And both gazelle and lizards were two of those animals used in representations of uh, demons, uh, protective demons, but also the, the um, dangerous ones. So it seems like the beliefs in demons uh, uh, and protection, magic protection from ancient Egypt are still alive uh, today. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you.